Anna Oyeri ran Open Society. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because it's sort of something which has come up in different presentations, um, to what extent is the, do you feel that within the UN the sort of security tail is wagging the programmatic dog? And what can be done to at least um, make security decisions, which ultimately, you know, uh, security officers are advisors to, to UN officials, to, 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 to make, um, to have better intelligence which informs the advice of security officers? That's a good question. Thank you very much. Who's next? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the speakers for the most informative uh, presentations. I am Khalid Al Mubarak, media counselor, the Embassy of Sudan in London. I've got two points, if I may. Uh, the first is uh, about the presentation of uh, Irene Mosel. It's, uh, I'm sorry she was not given access to uh, enter the, the Sudan, but is she aware of uh, the source of mistrust, which is that during the uh, civil war, the long civil war, Operation Life, Lifeline Sudan was used in order to feed the rebels. And also arms were channeled sometimes through aid agencies. This has been documented not only by our government, but by uh, investigative journalists from the West. Uh, my second point is uh, to uh, Mr. Jonathan, which is about uh, 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 have you uh, consciously chosen a historical uh, approach? Because now there is the Darfur Regional Authority, uh, which is supported by the US, the UN, the African Union, Britain, uh, Sudanese government, everybody. And there is policy also for access for uh, humanitarian organizations. My other point is uh, the ICC. Uh, the ICC was seen, especially in the Sudan, as part of uh, a promise to the rebel movements to, uh, if you continue to fight, then the, the Western powers will intervene, uh, hand you over Khartoum. And this was the assessment also of the International Crisis Group, that after the failures, the, the rebels were uh, emboldened because they thought if they could, and this is still going on because there are certain forces, especially in the United States, encouraging uh, the rebels in South Kordofan and uh, Blue Nile and in Darfur that if you continue to fight, then the United States will enter Khartoum and will hand you over power, which is an illusion and which is a very dangerous illusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, Mark Simmons. Um, I I don't want to to go too deeply into the um, political or conspiracy theory uh, arguments that might emerge from these presentations, but thank you for them. Um, I just wondered what we can learn from Darfur in the context of South Kordofan and Blue Nile. Um, it strikes me that we are in danger of repeating. Um, mistakes over and over again in some of these contexts. Um, and actually we both want the same thing. We've just heard there's a lot of mistrust between the government of Sudan and some of the people who are engaged in that context. But actually we want the same thing. Neither of us wants another Darfur. Some of us don't want it because we don't want civilian deaths. We don't want access difficulties. Um, some of us don't want it because we don't want media profile or um, because it somehow just makes us uncomfortable having lots and lots of foreign people running around telling us what to do, which I fully understand and sympathize with. Um, but what we haven't done in South Kordofan, I think, or in Darfur, is really understood the context, really made an effort to understand the context in which we're operating as humanitarian actors. We haven't really made the case, I don't think, for why humanitarian intervention is important. We haven't framed it in a way that makes us seem like we're on the same side. We framed it almost as if we're on opposite sides, when actually we're trying to serve 
the same people. We haven't made the case uh, from the humanitarian side to the government of why it's important of the, uh, for example, the knock-on impact that lack of humanitarian assistance has on the whole population of the country for which they have sovereign responsibility. And we haven't really done very much to repeat principle or maintain principle, which now makes it very difficult for us in South Kordofan to turn around and say, actually, um, we haven't really been meeting humanitarian needs in Darfur for the last 10 years, but we'd really like to start doing it now in South Kordofan, please. So we need still to repeat principles, even if it seems as if they're not necessarily worth repeating. Um, and as others have said, we need to keep engaging with the government and with non-state armed actors. I might also throw out there that perhaps, instead of relying on humanitarian assistance, we need to recognize that these conflicts go on for a long time and that we should assist in a different way. We should assist in a way which builds the resilience of the local community to withstand these kinds of shocks so that we don't get left in a situation where the only way in which these people will survive is if we have humanitarian access, which is very, very difficult to achieve. So I would like to propose that we really rethink the way in which we deliver some of this assistance in these kinds of non-state armed actor and government actor conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of comments online. Um, Irina. Yeah, um, I'll just read them out um, briefly and then maybe we can answer. So there's two questions from the online audience. Uh, the first one from Rob Morris, who's a postgraduate researcher at SOAS London, who's saying that despite the fact that both the government of Sudan and the government of South Sudan had similar objections to allowing humanitarian access, there were very divergent outcomes. The government of South Sudan allowed access, whereas the government of Sudan did not. To what extent is this due to the international community's increased leverage over the government of South Sudan due to its role in supporting the creation of South Sudan and material support? Are there any other reasons? Um, the second question is from Tom Law, who's a journalist at the Sudan Tribune, um, who's asking, are NGOs reticent to push for access or publicize the extent of the humanitarian situation as they do not want to jeopardize their existing projects in Sudan? Sorry, they, so they, they don't... So, could you repeat that? So, are they reticent to push for I'm access? Reticent, yeah. reticent, sorry. Yeah, yeah. As they do not want to jeopardize their existing projects in Sudan. <coughs> okay, thank you very much for those two. Uh, so, I think we've had, what, five or six comments and questions. Uh, let's go back to our speakers now. And um, who would like <coughs> to have a go at one or two of those? Jonathan, how are you getting on in Canada there? <laughs> I'm doing all right. I, uh, trouble hearing some, but I can definitely uh, respond to the gentleman from the uh, Sudanese embassy. Okay. Um, with um, you, you brought up the DRA, so for those who don't know, the DRA is the Darfur Regional Authority. This was an outcome of a peace agreement signed between one rebel faction, Liberation and Justice Movement, and the government of Sudan in Doha in 2010. The Darfur Regional Authority is technically speaking the most powerful in Darfur, although many people would say that it doesn't actually wield the power, the power is still uh, at the level of the, of the governors or at the, with the NCP in Khartoum. Um, a lot of the NGOs, uh, people who work for the NGOs that we spoke to for this report um, were, after the agreement was signed, was optimistic, were optimistic about um, the fact that they were going to be able to increase access and perhaps do development on the back of this agreement. Perhaps the DRA would be better able to facilitate their access and greater assistance to certain territories. Uh, unfortunately, um, and I've been following this fairly closely, we see absolutely no evidence that the DRA uh, has done anything to increase access or to increase assistance uh, to vulnerable populations, either inside government controlled or rebel controlled uh, areas uh, of, of kingdom. Okay, w um, would you like to pick up any of the other questions? No? Um, if not, d don't worry, we'll give you another go in, in a minute. Um, okay, please do this. Irina. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to respond also to the question of the uh, gentleman from the Sudanese embassy. I mean, I think the question you raise is obviously a very legitimate concern, and it is right that during the last war there was um, aid which was misused and used for political aims by, you know, the, the SPLM, but also by the government, by both sides. And that is definitely a history and, you know, a, a legitimate concern. Um, but I think equally in, in international law, um, you know, it says that uh, a government cannot arbitrarily withdraw, or at least has obligations as well to facilitate humanitarian access um, and not block access. So, if there are, you know, concerns in terms of uh, in, in terms of such issues, there's also an obligation on the government to maybe consider ways in which, you know, such concerns, which are obviously valid, can be minimised. So, for example, one way of doing that would be to obviously allow increased international and or other actors, which can be agreed to by both sides, to monitor where aid is going. Increased presence of independent actors um, who could monitor where aid is going, what is happening with aid. Um, but I would say there's also obligations to, you know, in, in to assist populations. Um, with, with such dire humanitarian needs. Um, and of course, you know, we would have loved to go to Sudan and, and uh, so solicit your views, but we, we weren't able to. We also tried to get uh, the views from the embassy here, but did not, um, did not receive um, much feedback, unfortunately. Um, just to respond maybe to, to one of the other um, the online questions, um, I think the second question about you know NGOs reticent to um, as they do not want to jeopardize existing projects, um, I think that is very much the the case as and that came out very strongly in the in the research that that NGOs um, or the UN as well I mean s felt very almost held hostage as they were saying and and weren't sure how to um, how to engage without jeopardizing their programs in other areas and 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 there was much. Um, many questions around what would be best strategies to do this and, and how to engage in terms of um, finding ways to engage without jeopardizing their projects. Um, so that was definitely the, something that came out of the research. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on two as well. Just on, on Joanna's question of uh, UN security management systems. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. I think the, the <laughs> comment of the... Uh, the way in which currently, unfortunately, uh, the decisions are often made can and does limit programs in, in large parts of, of the world where humanitarian actors work. Um, in South Sudan, we've been quite lucky that we've, been, we've managed to overcome a lot of them, and quite frankly, it does often boil down to, to personalities and, and, and skills, and the chief security advisor has played an extremely enabling role. Um, what can we do to, to address that? In particular, if, if I can link it to other questions, hearing a stronger push for OCHA or other UN actors to get involved, in part perhaps to pave the way or also shield NGOs from some of these difficult uh, positions that, that they, they often feel they are in if, if they're sticking out their neck above the rest, um, I think does have to be working more closely with the security part of the UN. So, I mean, Darfur, which was a, a best practice, I think did that, and that's what we're trying to do, whether that is through having humanitarian actors as part of security risk assessments. Uh, the NGO Forum in South Sudan, for example, has participated in the security risk assessment that took place into the non-state uh, areas. Uh, we've been pushing very hard for OCHA to be part of those security risk assessments, because since we had built up the relationship for months and months in advance, we felt we should be the first on the ground. That was still denied, so even that is still a, a challenge. But having the ability to engage more closely and to have also dedicated where <coughs> possible, and again, this costs money, but we've been asking donors for it to say, can we have security officers that are dedicated to this, that really have a focus on supporting humanitarian actors um, and don't necessarily think, in our case, it's in particular, uh, you know, we have, I think, uh, only six uh, security officers who are actually UNDSS staff um, and who are used to working with agencies, funds, and programs. The majority tend to work for the peacekeeping mission. And so their view on what security management looks like and who their major client is is going to be completely different uh, to, uh, to a security officer that's working for a humanitarian actor. Um, the the on, on the other question uh, that had come from the the online forum, um, uh, the different outcomes and is it about leverage? I mean, yes, I think leverage is very important. Uh, in the case of, of South Sudan, I would say leverage or, or influence or peer pressure, and, and perhaps one of the reasons we did get the outcome um, that that we have gotten, uh, and one of the reasons that. For me, the the case of Zhongli State is particularly important, not just because of the the 150,000 people that have 
been affected by the conflict in Peebor County, but because it sets a precedent, um, was the timing. You know, it is in South Sudan, we are, uh, it, it, there is a, a government that has only been in place for two years. Of course, it's a newly independent country. And so the engagement that the international community has had and the dialogue that's been had to say, what, you know, what kind of country do, would you like to be and how would you like to uh, meet the obligations that you have now signed up to, including the Geneva Conventions and humanitarian frameworks, um, I think could take place <coughs> in a very different way than it could have been in another context. So um, definitely the peer pressure, uh, particularly when it's coming from uh, sources that are trusted by the actor making the decision. I think this was the case for South Sudan, that a lot of the actors trying to influence and to engage with the authorities were, were uh, actors that were trusted. Good, thank you very much. Um, Ivor, I'll maybe keep you till the, the, the end of the next round, is that all right? It's fine. Um, any more questions from from the audience here? Yeah. Uh, can you wait, wait for the mic? Is the microphone coming? Hi. Um, my name is Tim Doran. I work at Diffid. Um, I wanted to ask Irina. You picked up on the fact that Arab and um, African NGOs often have greater access um, in Sudan, um, the sort of non-traditional agencies, and I wondered how closely. UN agencies and INGOs are liaising with those kind of organizations, and is there scope for that liaison to be scaled up? And could those organizations play a greater negotiating role between the non state actors, the governments, and the sort of international community? Any good question? A any more from, from the audience here? Yeah? Another one? Uh, hi, uh, Daniel Tucker from Conciliation Resources. It's sort of similar, along a similar line as that. But um, what is the reason for, given the access issues, that there's been a relatively limited engagement with local NGOs and local civil society actors? Very interesting question also. Uh, any more? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Kamal. Chairman of the SPLM North in, uh, in the UK. Um, I would like to welcome the, the research and the analysis for the humanitarian uh, crisis in Sudan. Um, I'm here also to ensure that SPLM will do everything to, to grant access to the NGOs in our control areas. An issue of trust it has been a long time. Um, we've been experiencing that for the last 80 years with the NCP. Um, been a number of violations from the NCP part term of getting access to our areas. In the past, uh, we have a number of national NGOs being granted uh, access in our area, and most of them tend to be uh, security personnel from the government. So that has uh, created a huge barrier between us. Um, however, we will still continue uh, to work with the, NC with the NCP to ensure that food has been delivered to the needy people in our control area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all the people that have spoken have spoken about the importance of dialogue um, with the Sudanese government. Um, but I was just wondering, is, is there an end point? I mean, how much longer uh, do you think that uh, the international community will be willing to um, take these negotiations if humanitarian access isn't granted? Uh, just thinking again uh, about the lessons learned from Darfur. At present in Darfur, we have a situation whereby um, <laughs> obstruction to humanitarian access has created a situation where operations are so expensive that many organizations are leaving. Um, and whilst these negotiations are ongoing, essentially many organizations are propping up uh, local uh, bureaucracies which are running very uh, effectively. So uh, really the question is how much patience do you think the international community has to continue these negotiations in South Kordofan? Okay. Um, uh, very good. Uh, that's the end of that round and probably the end of the last round of questions because we're approaching the end of our time. So I'll give each of the speakers um, one last chance to have a go at your audience. Um, who'd like to start? Irina, you want to start? Thank you. Um, 
on the question by by Diffit um, on on Arab and African NGOs, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think there's been to answer your question, there's been limited engagement so far. I think a bit more recently, um, I think Ocha has also established an access unit in Khartoum, um, which has been trying to reach out more and more, including also the on, on the NGO side. I think initially they were not um, invited or were not participating so much in, in the coordination meetings. I think that has changed recently and there has been you know, increasing engagement with, uh, with these NGOs um, to try and see whether there would be ways of, of, of working with them. But to be honest, I think there's, there's little sort of evidence to suggest whether that is actually the case or, or not. And I think that's something to to look out for and to engage more with and see whether this would be would be something that could be done. But that's certainly something that came up during the during the research a lot that um, people thought this would be a worthwhile avenue exploring. Um, on the other question of um, the limited engagement with with local NGOs, I think that's a very um, and I think local civil society. It's a, it's a very important question and I think. Well, the short answer is that a lot of actors, I think, based in, in Sudan, as we said before, are very nervous about how this the engagement with local actors um, might be perceived by the government and whether this would jeopardize their operations elsewhere. Um, I think in some ways this is surprising, though, given that you know many of these organizations have been on the ground and have been there for a long time, including you know have received much capacity building or have you know a long experience on humanitarian uh, delivery, including many were present during the times of, of the previous war. Um, so I think there is a certain capacity on the ground on which uh, there could be built and much more engagement with these uh, organizations to look at local ways of addressing humanitarian needs. And this could be done in, in a variety of ways. It doesn't have to be cross-border, but it could also be you know, in many ways um, supporting local protection initiatives, um, which some, some very good research that has been done um, has shown you know, what's actually really important is how to engage with people and how um, local initiatives, such as you know, even simple things like how to, where to lie down or what to do when when there are bombs dropping, and you know, initiatives in terms of capacity building for first aid and other things can can help in such situations. Um, I think this this also. Just the last point on this question, this also goes not just obviously for um, civil society or local NGOs in, in SPLM areas, but I think also there's been a surprising lack of engagement with civil society organizations um, on the Sudanese side. And I think this is something, again, that you know should be explored much more in terms of both you know not only humanitarian access, but also in the longer term confidence building, political solutions. I think that there's much more scope to engage with Sudanese civil society um, in order to, to um, solve the current conflict and address the issues. Um, yeah, lastly, on, on the issues of timelines, I mean, I think that's exactly you know what the research was bringing out. Obviously, there should be, um, we have to continue engaging. But I think you know, but one of the key issues is until when or when you know have uh, many actors felt that you know there is there has to be some sort of timeline set, and if we continue to say you know there is an agreement and then it isn't implemented until when can we follow that through or when is it know, legitimate to look at other alternatives, when do we have to look at other, other alternatives? And that, of course, is very much determined by the level of need in, in the areas and how dire need is. And I think, again, there's a point to be made. There are increasing, um, there's increasingly well, um, increasing good information coming out of SPLM areas, which is, you know, increasingly uh, monitoring need and by local actors also supported by international actors in terms of capacity building, in terms of the rigorousness of the needs. So I think there is more and more information available which shows that you know the situation is, uh, the humanitarian is situation is severe and that is clearly kind of, should be an indication to us when you know this, <laughs> there has to be an, an, uh, a certain end to this uh, timeline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan. Sure, sorry, I had trouble hearing some of those, but uh, let me just talk briefly uh, to the question about local NGOs. Um, this has been a big issue in our work throughout the conflict, and um, you might sort of instinctively think that local NGOs would be much better placed to access um, all areas of Darfur, especially areas controlled by our non state groups. Um, in actuality, uh, the rebel groups in particular themselves are extraordinarily hesitant to deal with the vast majority of local NGOs. Uh, they believe, rightly or wrongly, that staff members for these NGOs have been placed there uh, by the government primarily to spy 
on territory controlled by rebels. And according to the rebels, there is significant evidence to back up this claim. As a result, the vast majority of local Sudanese NGOs are not allowed into this territory at all. There are a few exceptions, but in those cases, after the ICC indictment, the government of Sudan also expelled a few local NGOs, and these were the ones that were most widely accepted by the rebel groups. So in a lot of cases, for reasons of one side or the other, the local NGOs have been a non-starter. That said, using local staff is obviously necessary under any circumstance, and if we're going to be realistic in terms of Darfur 2013 and 2014, the government of Sudan has shown no inclination that it's going to let international staff back into most areas of Darfur, especially rebel controlled territory. So if anyone's going to be allowed back in, it's going to be local staff working for international organizations, maybe having projects that are remotely managed from Khartoum or perhaps from abroad, and that would be a best case scenario. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, perhaps on the same point, I mean, both in terms of the current situation in South Sudan, but I would also say on my experience in other contexts, I think we'd have to be very careful what we're talking about when we say local organizations or local NGOs and what positions to put them in. I would be very concerned in terms of a staff security management perspective at the risk that you're putting people into. So whilst, yes, of course, as in the majority of humanitarian responses, you know, 90% of staff will be local and there should be a lot of capacity building and resilience building of the communities in the areas where they are. Those staff indeed, as Jonathan said, may not be able to cross front lines uh, as easily as internationals can. And so in terms of uh, negotiations, uh, decision making and representation, um, I, I think it would be extremely risky in many cases when you're talking about a clear conflict parties or, or a, a, a conflict between the state <coughs> and the non-state armed group to put uh, local actors into such positions of vulnerability. So, I mean, for, for Zhonglei State, for example, the first few assessments we did, uh, initially we, we, we went only with international staff and we were very conscious of, of the risks uh, to any national staff, even from different parts of the country that didn't have any either personal or uh, or any any ethnic link to this particular conflict, um, and both in South Sudan and other situations where I've worked in, the vast majority of cases when there is uh, interference or intimidation or harassment or arrests by either by any conflict party, be they state or non-state, it'll it'll focus on on national actors, and so I think there also has to be very much uh, an awareness of what role internationals can play to protect against that, because internationals do have, I think, the ability to, to, to withstand and they have the protection of their agency and their actor, um, uh, or in the worst case, to get kicked out of the country and go home, and that's an option that people on the ground don't have. So I think we have to be careful what we're talking about um, and what roles to place people in. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Um, Ivor. Um, I just sorry, sorry to interject for one second. I have yep. to drop off uh, this brief double book, but thank you very much. If anyone wants to contact me, my contact's in the back of the report. I'm happy to talk to anyone. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed, and um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution, both written in the report and uh, spoken uh, this afternoon. Thanks. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Again, just uh, a couple of comments on the question regarding potential role for national NGOs or civil society. I think also ties in with the question from Diffid around the potential role for um, NGOs from not, you know, non-Western NGOs and so forth. I think again, one of the issues in both of those is the you know this challenge of coordination. I think we, over time the sort of the traditional humanitarian sectors recognised the need for coordination for different agents to be able to talk together. Um, and we've invested a certain amount of time and effort in establishing what's an increasingly complex um, coordination mechanism through the clusters and other such other such mechanisms. Um, and I think when we're looking at the sort of role of people who've been traditionally outside of those mechanisms, there's questions to what extent they're even aware of those mechanisms. Are they able to, you know, do they even know these coordination structures exist? If they are aware, do they want to engage them or do they choose not to engage them for various reasons? Or even if they want to engage them, do they actually find that due to language barriers, um, communication styles, whatever it is, they're not actually able to effectively participate in these coordination mechanisms. So as we're looking at the potential role for, say, non-traditional, you know, non-Western NGOs or civil society organisations, national NGOs, how do we structure the 
had to look at those coordination structures to bring those people around the table and make sure they can contribute effectively to the other discussions that are ongoing. Thank you very much. Um, I must say I'm tempted to, um, this, this all brings back to me things from my own past in, in Afghanistan. And also most recently actually, my, my past in, in the UAE, where I've spent the last three years working with the government there on their aid program. And I think the answer to your question as to whether it's worth engaging with um, actors from uh, the Gulf or other parts of the Arab world is yes, and you will find them increasingly interested in engaging. But it did remind me that, of course, I guess it's true in, in, in Sudan that the language of aid is probably still largely English. Um, but the language of the country, if I remember correctly, is, is not. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, thank you to the audience for um, your attention and for your extremely interesting uh, questions and comments. Um, we've managed to keep very well to time, and I thank the speakers for uh, being um, concise uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the two reports that are on the on the website. Uh, and I'd also remind you that this was the second in a series of three um, uh, presentation events about humanitarian negotiations. The third will be next month, and it will be about uh, Somalia. Um, the video of this event will be available in a few days uh, online so you can um, uh, you can catch that as well um, in in Afghanistan in the 1980s um, the aid provided to m many parts of the country came cross-border because the government uh, didn't agree to it and it was very risky and it was secret and it was confidential and so on. Um, then in um, 1989 when I arrived as part of the UN um, effort um, we were able over a relatively short period of time to persuade the then government in Kabul, the communist government in Kabul to open the country up to uh, both cross line and cross border aid and um, that worked quite effectively. Uh, and then, of course, the um, Mujahideen parties that had been um, in the opposition uh, took over the government. And now, of course, um, those um, parties that are in the government um, find themselves in the government, but dealing as on the other side of the... Um, argument that they were having 15 years earlier. Um, in all of these things, I think it's, it's, well, it's not easy to forget, but one must always try to remember that um, what we're trying to do is to bring humanitarian aid to people who need it, in places where they need it, when they need it. And if you think about your own families, when they need help, they need it now. Uh, and that's when many people in many parts of Sudan and South Sudan need help. They need it now. So I think that we can't um, um, rest if there is some opportunity to improve uh, our ability as humanitarian organizations to get aid to people who need it when they need it. So if that's um, enough, that's, that's it. Thank you very much for attending and uh, hope to see you next time.